obviously, if it's a dead law, now you see all the structures you have over there. And that will be the best thing you can do. You go over there, spend some time, and then you wait. You wait until the Thai start to come in again. And then you see the way the Thai, you know, works in, and then you will figure out where and the fish might be. And that's your homework. Is nothing better than that you can do. It. Go on a dead low tie and scout the area. That was Enrico Puglisi with a great tip for your next saltwater trip. EP fibers and stripers today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Make sure you click uh, the subscribe button and your app of choice if you get a chance so you get updated uh, when that next podcast episode drops. Enrico Puglisi is here to share the story of creating um, EP fibers and a career in fly fishing and fly tying. We find out how and where to go for stripers on Long Island, where the best saltwater resource is, and uh, which brands of cigars you must find, you must track down and, and try. Enrico shares his favorite today. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. Angler's Coffee roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. And I'm one of those anglers who's been loving Angler's Coffee. Great tasting, robust, and good to go. They just released a new subscription program, and you can get 20% off this box and all products at anglerscoffee.com. Just use the coupon code WETFLYSWING at checkout to get 20% off of great coffee today. That's anglerscoffee.com. OPST's rods represent decades of dedication to sustained anchor two-handed casting. A rod reflects its designer, and these rods are a true illustration of Skagit master Ed Ward's vision. The Micro Series uh, from 3 to 5 weight comes exceptionally close to single-handed specs and is proving to be a unique tool for trout and smallmouth anglers. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to check out the lineup right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash O-P-S-T. So without further ado, here's Enrico Puglisi from epflies.com. This is Dave from wetflyswing.com, and I'm uh, happy to introduce Enrico Pugli- uh, Puglisi today uh, from uh, uh, epflies.com. How's it going, Enrico? It's doing great. Thank you. How about yourself? Good, good. I uh, I kind of mangled your uh, name a little bit there. Can you can you pronounce it for me again? Uh, sure, no problem. It's kind of difficult, but you know everyone should do the best they can. It's Enrico Puglisi. There you go. Perfect. All right. So we got that for the record. <laughs> uh, we're going to dig into you. Uh, you know, we were just talking to about, um, you know, where I first heard you about, heard about you. And I, I can't remember. I mean, your name's kind of all over the place out there. You've got the the EP fiber and all the fly tying stuff. Um, we're going to dig into all of that today and maybe even a focus on some striped bass fishing. Uh, but before we get there, talk about how you first got into fly fishing, how that all came to be. Uh, well, it's... Uh... It, it, it started when back home, you know, where I'm coming from, we, you know, Sicily is my native uh, country. And I used to go fishing with my father at the early age, four or five years old. And uh, I always been fishing um, mainly in salt water because, uh, you know, we, I used to live very close to, to the salt water. And uh, my father, you know, told me all the little tricks, you know, to catch fish, of course, and not only for the fun of it, and uh, but also, you know, to put some food on the table, you know. Those days, uh, that's what we used to do it. You take from nature, you know, rather if it's from the water, you know, fishing or from the land and, you know, and the river and so forth and so on. So the fishing was always there. So then uh, in 1980, when uh, I came in the United States and established myself over here, um, several years later, four or five years later, I discovered fly fishing. And to me, it was really intricate. And, uh, you know, I took that as a challenge. And to me, 
you know, catching fish, you just put a couple of feathers on in a hook and fool those fish. You know, it was a really intricate. So, and that's pretty much how I got started in the fly that's, fishing. That's it. So, so mid eighties, you got started and what, what brought you over to the U S uh, initially? Why, why did you decide to come this way? Uh, well, I, I met Karen, my wife and, um, uh, you know, to make a long story short, here I am. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. Because if I, uh, if I didn't meet my wife uh, back those days, I would not be here in the United States, of course. I mean, my profession was uh, a chef. So I was basically, you know, working all over Italy and Europe as well. So that wasn't my profession. So I had the opportunity to go pretty much everywhere, but never thought about the United States. And then uh, it's one of those things, you know, you you meet your your bride and, uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. And you guys never thought about maybe uh, Karen just sticking in Sicily and then kind of doing your doing the thing oh, over yeah, there? Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. We we thought that and, uh, you know, to be there. and But, you know, it's one of those things. And then coming over here for me was... You know, discovering the new world, let's put this way. And um, I say, okay, you know, I'm going to give him a shot. You see if I like it. And if not, we go back in Italy or we go elsewhere. You know? There you go. There and you go. that's how that happened. And, and, and it sounds like it, you liked it. I, I, uh, it's funny because we talk about with my family, we, we talk about traveling and, and talking about, and actually Italy, you know, and Europe and things like that comes up saying, well, gosh, we, we could probably live over there. It'd be fun to live over there for a little while. What do you think is, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how long it's been since you've been there, but, but what makes that area where you grew up so uh, unique or so special? Well, you know, Sicily, as everybody knows, is an island, you know, and, uh, it, it, it's a very, I mean, it's around the middle of the Mediterranean, and we got invaded pretty much by everyone out there. Mm. I mean, it, you know, including the Americans. So we kept through centuries all the culture, you know, from, gee, I wow. mean, from the Turkish, you know, to the to the Africans and to the Greek and to the Spanish and to, yep. I mean, you name it. So we, you know, having that culture that you cultivate it and, and you keep it for, you know, it's, it's century and century and century. So it, it makes the island a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, diverse. unique. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and diverse, of course, because we have, you know, we have a little, you know, a little bit of all the other, uh, you know, country that's surrounding us. So, and that, that's what Sicily is. And, uh, uh, and the, being on the Mediterranean, of course, you know we have a, uh, you know we have the kind of advantage uh, of the good weather, even if it's in the winter time. Mm. Uh, and that's what you know that what makes Sicily, you know, very versatile because yeah. you know you can live on the on the coastline, you can go up on the mound, or you, and and that's pretty much that's it. you know it. That's it. Yeah. And yeah. now you're in. Uh, are you in New York now? Yes, um, I'm here in the same uh, town when I first landed in this country, and I basically never moved out of this town. And yeah, there you yeah. Go. So there, and, 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 and the weather, uh, I guess the weather in New York isn't quite the same as the Mediterranean, right? But I guess no. you, you like it? <laughs> no, it is not. It is not. But, you know, fortunate enough, uh, uh, you know, I travel a lot, and, yeah. uh, me and, my, my, and my family. You know, every year, pretty much, except this past year, you know, we go back in Italy and, you know, and elsewhere. Yeah. So we are pretty lucky to That's to right. have this opportunity. That's right. Cool. Well, uh, and, and what is it, you know, I just want to start us off here on the fishing side. So as far as your home water, when somebody asks you, what is your home water, what what, what is that, that water? Uh, well, it's the Long Island Sound. Uh, I live on the North Shore of the, you know, basically... Uh, it's the tri-state area, and I live in Queens. Um, so we cover the, the North Shore. So we have the stripers, the bluefish, pretty much. And uh, I can even walk into my own backyards when it's a striper uh, season starts, which now, um, actually, uh, I believe it, you know, few fish that might be out there. It's been uh, yeah. quite nice the past week. So and that would really make you know, easy for me, 
And, uh, you know, interesting enough, when I started fly fishing, I started for trout. You know, fishing the Long Island, we have a couple of rivers in Long Island, then obviously the more famous Cuskill area. And then after that, uh, uh, what was that, probably 88, 89, when I discovered the Long Island Sound for stripers, bluefish and weak fish uh, as well. And that's how I get started promoting salt water. But originally, I did start, you know, trout fishing, believe it or not. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. And you still have some trout flies and things like that over at Oh, the absolutely. Now uh, we have this uh, brand new line uh, of trout uh, dry flies for the time being. And I'm already working on nymphs and streamers incorporating 100% the EP fibers and blended uh, fibers. It's been uh, a extremely uh, successful uh, for us on the dry flies uh, for the past uh, three years now and uh, people more and more they're learning about this trigger point that we we offered and that they've been just you know love it uh, I mean it's it kind of open a new new frontier on the on dry flies so mm. and we're very happy about that oh, nice nice. Well, and I wanted to just take it, you know, we mentioned uh, stripers. So uh, in that area, I mean, how is striper fishing? Is that is it uh, pretty pretty good or what, what's what, what, how are things looking now? Well, you know, uh, these days, obviously, it's not what it used to be on, you know, on the early 90s and the mid 90s and so forth and so on. It's been up and down, up and down. Uh, but overall, uh, it is good. You know, we... In my area, we don't see that many of those big fish the way we used to, but we do, you know, plenty of schoolies, and, uh, you know, we having fun. You know, the fish are there, uh, and we hope that they're gonna, we're going to see more and more. We haven't seen that many of uh, uh, bluefish around the way it used to be those days as well, but I'm very confident they will come back. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, I think we'll have time uh, today to dig into a little bit more on the striper fishing and that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that side. But I just want to start off, you know, obviously the flies, that's something I think you're known for. Um, and, you know, like we said, the EP fiber stuff. Um, but maybe we just focus on what the saltwater patterns and and we can think about striper flies or whatever or just saltwater flies in general. But what to you makes a good saltwater pattern? You know, when somebody's tying a saltwater pattern, they're going on a trip, whether it's for stripers or bonefish i mean is there are there some general things you could say that you should do for all those saltwater patterns uh the general things that uh, i would say to everyone rather you tie your own flies or you buy the flies you know for your trips or whatever this situation dictated is to buy the flies that it will look good to the species you are targeting Mm -hmm. Uh, most of the time people buy the flies that look good, you know, yeah, to, to them. themselves, <laughs> but that is not uh, the case, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that means, um, you know, you need to know more about the species that you are going fishing for. And uh, today we have the advantage, you know, uh, to gathering information pretty much, uh, for any species that we we be fishing. So my suggestion to everyone is that it doesn't matter where you are going fishing is do your homework and see what the the, the patterns, uh, you yeah. know, generally they are suggested for that. Yeah. And well, then you go and, and you're scouting around and, and again, look at the flies that it will appeal to the fish and not to the fishermen. What would be the um, for if we just keep it on the stripers? What what would be a good pattern or some good a couple of patterns for striper fishing? Um, I mean, in general. Well, I guess if you had to say, I, I don't know if you have your own patterns or what. I mean, I was thinking, you know, recently uh, we have a uh, actually a Lefty Cray episode coming up here. I, I'm doing a little celebration for Lefty, and I learned a lot about his life, which was really interesting. Obviously, so you got the Deceiver, you got some Absolutely. of these other right, some of these popular ones. Are there other flies that either you have or other ones that are out there that people should be thinking about? Well, look, you know, it, we all started, you know, and <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, even including myself, when I started, I started like anybody else, you know, tying deceivers and clouses. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, the slab side from Lou Tabri. 
we all started that way. So, and today is those, you know, of course, those flies, they're still going strong. There's no question about that. Uh, but, you know, in my case, uh, obviously, I do use at this point, you know, the any flies made with the EP fibers or yeah. any other materials. So, to me, uh, the, the fly to go basically is the peanut butter uh, uh, style flies, you know, and then, of course, the various colors. To me, that is the flies that I fish the most, not only for stripers, but pretty much for almost anything you know mm -hmm. so uh, if you if you targeting striped bass and you do have a you know peanut butter uh style flies yeah. then you cannot go wrong with that and and describe just for somebody who's a t total uh new to you know kind of what you have going what what is what are the peanut butter style flies well the peanut butter style flies are resembling the you know the the bunker uh, patterns when it's a juvenile. So they are a wide profile uh, bait fish. So you want to imitate the fly that he has the wide profiles. And usually, you know, they starting about, you know, inch and a half, or two inch to three, four inches. That's just pretty much the size that everybody, you know, fish with it these days. Yeah. And then when he's on the adult stage, you know, about 12 or 15 inch, and then it's become to be a big fly. So hmm. it's not really uh, that popular uh, fishing with that big size of, of, of a peanut butter. You know, that's the, that's the reality. You know, we fishing with that three, and, three to four, five inch uh, style peanut bunker, then you're good. You can manage it with a nine weight, eight weight, and so forth and so on. So... You keep that in mind. And in Long Island Sound, you know, your best bet is creating the silhouette of a wide profile body flies. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. OPST's rods represent decades of dedication to sustained anchor two handed casting. A rod reflects its designer, and these rods are a true illustration of Skagit Master Edward's vision. The Pure Skagit series falls right in line with OPST's principles, a short, medium, fast-action rod that sports an extra-sensitive tip, all while maintaining a powerful lower section that's true and sure to leave you impressed by its feather-launching potential. And I've been using this rod for steelhead uh, lately and been blown away by its lightweight and, and the power it packs. You almost don't realize it's in your hand. It's Seriously, it's like... Um, it's ultralight. So that was, you know, thinking about how to describe this thing. I think that's the word that comes back to me. Uh, I was casting some big flies for steelhead with a sink tip and a bunch of wind. And I didn't have a problem at all, even with my less than perfect uh, casting technique. So I've been impressed with the 11 foot seven weight, but there is a huge uh, line. They have uh, three different rods in the lineup uh, from six to uh, nine weights and from 10 foot eight inch all the way up to 12 foot three inch, which pretty much for me covers covers it all. So um, I'm excited, excited to dig into more of this. Targeted towards fishing large trout and up to Canadian and Alaskan king salmon, this series should cover all the bases when targeting those larger fish. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to check out the lineup right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash OPST. Okay, back to the show. Okay, and uh, and if you were going out today for, say, stripers again, you could take any of those patterns. What would you grab if you had to grab yeah. one fly to, today? Well, today, in the beginning of the season, you know, those fish, the water's still cold. And those fish, they really, they're not really that active. So you want an attracting pattern, you know, color wise. So mainly, uh, my suggestion goes to anyone and, and myself too, of course, using like a white chartreuse, a white yellow with a little bit extra flash on it. And when you're retrieving the flies, you know, don't you slow down because again, those fish, they're not really that active. Uh, the water is cold. So it's not necessarily to give it a fast retrieving, stripping, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So you slow down and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, you're fishing in uh, three, four feet of water just to use a floating line with, I would say, probably around five, six feet long 
uh, leader that's plenty, and then you you ride on the money. That's it. That's it. Cool. Yeah. Um, and so I did want to touch more, you know, as we have time a little bit on, on the striper fishing. I, I get a lot of questions, and even out here, you know, we're on the other side of the country. You know, in California, we got a lot of people that love stripers down there, so I'm not sure, you know, how much overlap there is. I'm sure there's quite a bit, but um, I did want to touch on the um, EP fibers. Can you, again, to somebody who's totally new that hasn't heard of them, can you describe how that came to be and what those are all about, the, the brushes and everything you have going? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, when I when I started uh, in those days back in the late 80s, uh, there wasn't a really uh, synthetic materials. Uh, the EP fibers was not existing. Uh, the only synthetic material was available those days were the uh, Ultra Air by H.T. Thompson and uh, some in some fish air. But basically, those two uh, synthetic fibers that were made mainly, you know, to do jigs. Uh, so I used what was available. And then, of course, uh, those fibers have been uh, just, you know, a, a little bit too stiff, and you could not really create a wide profile mm. of fly. I mean, even if you could, the flies were, you didn't have the movement that I was looking for. So that's when I'm, I, I, I put myself, you know, in that position, say, okay, you know, I need to find the alternative to the feathers and marabou because those days, and not only we had a plenty of striped bass, but we had a plenty of bluefish. Mm. Uh, so the bluefish were mixed with the striper and vice versa. So basically, you you know when you hook a bluefish, is one fish, one fly, and there was, you know, you can imagine, you know, <laughs> a fly done with feathers and. Uh, and bucktail is is totally destroyed. Yeah. So you have to be a better way over here. I mean, you know, it takes me 15, 20 minutes to do a fly, and then one fish, one fly, that's not really working for me. And besides, uh, you cannot really create the you know, the the bunker a type of flies with the white profile. It's it, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, so I combine those. With you know, two situations. I need a, a material that doesn't get destroyed, and also I need a material that allow me to create the silhouette and the colors I needed. So, and then you know, it's one of those things. You go across uh, the materials, and then you see immediately what the materials will do for you, and that's pretty much how you know it started. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, in the beginning, of course, it was trial and error. Uh, experimenting this and experimenting that and put less, put more. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it was, it was like a journey for me. You know, it didn't happen in one, in one day, you know, he, and, and then of course, finding the right colors. It wasn't the colors of what they were not there, what you were looking for. So you have to work with, uh, with the manufacturing on those fibers. I mean, it was a really long process. Yeah, gotcha. And and now and on the brushes were so back then. So the, so we're talking what is this like mid nineties or something like that when you're kind of d- digging into the, all this it's, stuff. Uh, it, it, the brushes came up on the mid nineties, and then uh, it, 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 the brushes uh, when I started was a combination of the fibers uh, with uh, some you know the sparkling flash into it, and then uh, uh, you know right after the. Uh, the EP fibers, I came out with the silky fiber, which is a much thinner diameter than the regular EP fiber. So blending the two the two uh, fibers together in some flash, and that's when the brush pretty much started. And, and that was really uh, a big jump to the regular uh, fibers into the brushes, which uh, the brushes it really catch the time in an F, yeah. If you incorporated the brush and the fibers at the same time, but and, but today you know with all the variation on the brushes that I started in the mid nineties, uh, pretty much you can use one brush of one colors and you can create a one little bunker pattern, and then with some uh, you know permanent marker waterproof markers you give the coloration to the brush and then the day you have it, you put it. Mm. 
with a little eyes, and then you there you have it. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. a big, big. And, uh, you know, plenty, plenty uh, people out there, they really, uh, you know, appreciated the fact that these brushes are available uh, on their arsenal. So. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. And that's the big advantage. One of the big advantages of the brushes is that it, it improves your time. Instead of spending 20 minutes on a fly, you can zip one out pretty quick. Absolutely. You know, look, you know, in the beginning uh, and the, until today, I mean, the peanut butter uh, style of flies, it really, the technique hasn't changed too much. Uh, the main complaining about the, the, peanut, the peanut butter was not that the flies was not catching fish and not that the flies got destroyed, you know, with uh, with the bluefish. It wasn't at that. The main complaint was that it was a two-time consuming. And basically, you know, right from the beginning, I say, people, you want something good, then you're going to have to, you know, work on it. And uh, it's a matter of a practicing. And if you can do, you know, spend the 15 minutes to tie a, a clouser, you can spend the 15 minutes to tie a peanut butter, so pretty much you're on the same level. But the fly, you know, tying that fly with EP fibers, definitely the advantage is to create the silhouette you want it and the durability of the fly. So that's the that's difference. It. That's it. Okay. And that and that peanut butter style fly, you could pretty much fish that for a number of different species in the saltwater? That's correct. That's yeah. correct. In fact, uh, you know, it started over here in Little Neck Bay um, into the Sound, uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, I discovered that uh, they were using the same fly uh, for tarpon fishing down in Florida, and that's when every you know when, oh. they, when everything happened. You know what I mean? Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, perfect. So that so. yeah. <laughs> So that, that clarifies it. So basically, again, going back to stripers, if we were going out today or, well, let, let's take it to the, the, the peak season. When, when is the best time? If you had to pick one time to fish for stripers out in your neck of the woods, when would you be going? Well, in, the, in our area, it will be starting in pretty much April, May, and, um, and June, you know, first part of June. And then in the summer months, it's going to be too hot. The water is a little bit too okay. too hot as well. So summertime is kind of iffy, yeah. unless you're fishing at night. And then you come back into the fall in September, October, November. Those are the months, the peak for us. Okay. So so if you were heading out there in April or if it was April, May, June, you would be grabbing. What, what fly would you be grabbing or what couple of flies? Um, it will be uh, the the peanut bunker, of course, and uh, the colors I will generally use is three colors, but it will be the black and purple, gray and white, chartreuse and white. Those are the three colors. Uh, and then as we progress into the season, um, I will have a, a, a mullet type of patterns because that's, you know, getting ready for in the fall, when you have those mullet run mm. into the south shore, uh, and then you see those mullet run, and the definitely uh, stripers chasing those mullet as well. So th- those are the pretty much the two patterns you, you know, you look into it. Okay. All right. And our people and out there, I'm totally not familiar at all. I would love, I'm, and I'm hopeful to get out there, um, you know, soon. And, you know, I want, I want to travel all over the place. But for somebody who hasn't been there, you know, or is thinking about, maybe they, they, they're thinking about fishing for stripers. Is that something you can just kind of, you know, like you said, grab, grab the, some gear and your flies and head off over and fish off of the bank somewhere? Or what, what would you tell somebody that's new to it? Is, that, is this a doable fishery to kind of jump into? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, it's not difficult to do that. Uh, yes, if you're going, you know, it doesn't matter if you're going on the north on the north side of the island, on the south uh, side of the island. There is a lot of private property, so the access is not that easy. But you know, believe in me, you do your homework, and you there is a plenty of public space that you can go. There is a state park, you know, beach yeah. uh, side. You know, again, North Shore, South, and, and, you know, you'll be able to just to drive and walk in again and you fish. There is a plenty, plenty, plenty of room, you know, to fish. Yeah. And so it's not 
difficult to do that. Gotcha. It's very easy to do. Gotcha. What you need is a, is a, your fly rods, your, your little bag, you cut, you know, the with your flies and tip it, your boots, and uh, strongly, you know, I suggest to have like a, a little basket, uh, and that's it. You're in yeah. business. You're very, yeah. Very, well, what little basket? It does it matter? Does it matter what you? What would you recommend if somebody wanted uh, to grab one? Well, listen, you know, uh, those days uh, when I used, to, you know, I, I I was using one of those uh, uh, dishwashing little. Yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Doesn't yeah, matter. I started with that, and then uh, you know, years of later, uh, you know, the, some company they, you know, they manufacture that and made a little bit more fancier. Yeah, which is not with that and even these days there is a several company out there that they offer those baskets but definitely you're going fishing from the shore you have to have you one. know you get into the water you you're gonna need the baskets it will make your life much much that's easier right. that's right yeah okay and and so if you take us to the water so somebody is there they have their their gear um and they're getting ready to, to, to cast out there i mean what, what sort of tips would you give somebody if they're new to it and they're trying to find a striper off the bank there uh, you really, you know, you need to do uh, a little homework, and obviously you're looking for structures in the water, meaning, uh, you know, some rocks, uh, some boulders, uh, maybe uh, uh, some uh, little streams, you know, getting out into the waters as well. Uh, the best thing, you know, to, again, today it's much easier to go ahead and, you know, you look in a map and uh, even yeah. on your telephone and do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're looking for jetties. We do have a lot of jetties that are accessible pretty much from everywhere. Again, there is a plenty of state parks, mm-hmm. uh, south and north, uh, jetties that are always excellent, you know, and and the coves. And, uh, but the best thing uh, you can do, and my suggestion, and that's, you know, I tell you because from my own experience, the way I used to do it, when I well, I did my homework. Let's say I want to go in a brand new area, and I don't know mm-hmm. what it lays under the water to see where the structures are. Best thing you can do is you go in a dead low tide. Yeah, you go to the area where you want to fish. So on a dead low tide, you already know the level of the water when it will be in a high tide. So obviously, if it's a dead low, now you see all the structures you have over there. And that will be the best thing you can do. Yep. You go over there, spend some time, and then you wait. You wait until the tide start to come in again. And then you see the way the tide, you know, works in. And then you will figure out where and the fish might be. And that's your homework. Is there nothing better than that you can do? It. Okay. Go on a dead low tide and scout gotcha. the area. Gotcha. And, and on, just to keep on that track. So if you're out there, is there tide wise, is it better to fish it on an incoming tide or does it really matter? Um, it, you know, interesting enough, there is, uh, you know, places that it might be excellent on the incoming tide. There might be other places that will be excellent on the outgoing tide. Yeah. So those are things you need to discover in your own. Gotcha. So let's say that you fishing an area on an incoming tie and then no fish coming in or you don't catch anything, that doesn't mean the fish, they might not be there on the outgoing. But, you know, the advantage is that once you know the structures out there on the outgoing, you know how to work the tie on the way out. And then you, of course, you'll see if those fish, they might be there incoming on the outgoing. Most of the time, it depends again on the area, you have the fish coming in with the tie, stays with the tie, and then they will work their way out with the tie as well. So, again, it's always a home work. Yeah, so def- definitely. Where would you direct somebody? Well, I guess first, um, can you give out, you mentioned a state park or a jetty without giving out any secrets or anything. Is there one place you would recommend, you know, you've, you know, near your area or something that's pretty popular? Again, for that new person that just wants to kind of test it out. Well, you know, on the South Shore is, uh, you know, Jones, uh, Jones Beach and the Jones Inlet. There is uh, several parks over there. It's not really a secret. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, as well on the, on the North Shore, you just go, uh, if you, you go in the, again into in the Internet and you're looking, you know, in New York yep. State Park on, on Long Island Sound, north and south, 
they all listed over there. So it's not really, there is a no secret in, you know, to that. There yeah. is a, I can tell you, in, there is a several state park. You can easily go in with your car, park in, and you go fishing. And, okay. and you you'll find the place. That's right. You'll okay, perfect, place. perfect. And and then what about, um, you know, is, if somebody wanted to take a little bit further? I, I know, obviously, and I heard a little bit, I think maybe you're on your way to uh, slowly uh, moving out. I'm not sure how much you're going to be involved in the industry the you know, next few years to come. But who, who would you recommend? Is there a good resource, either a person or a website or somebody else you'd recommend to go to to learn about the kind of striper fishing and what you do? Today, pretty much everyone is involved, you know, on striper fishing and blue fishing and so forth and so on. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, uh, the, the local uh, fly shops, uh, they might carry local flies from from individual and they sell it to the local fly shop or uh, taco shops and things like that. Who is the local? C- can you give a shout out to one of the local fly shops around there? I'm not sure if uh, who those are. Are there are there quite a few fly shops in the area? Not really. Unfortunately, there is a, uh, there is a nothing left pretty much. The only one I can mention to you is... Uh, a campsite in uh, in Long Island, and then uh, the, I believe it, there is a, a a fly shop all the way out in Long Island. Um, it, it might be a combination of a fly shop and, and taco at the same at the same time. Uh, not much left, uh, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. in Long Island. And, and is that um, and is that mainly just because of the changes in the fishery population, and or, or why is that? Why aren't there more fly shops? Well, you know, uh, the internet changed everything, oh, right. uh, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it's yep. very easy to say. It's just you go on your telephone and you order. You know, when you order something online to go yeah. fishing, you know what you're looking for. Yeah. You know what I mean. You know what you're looking for, and you always get pretty much what you what you wanted. You know, it's easy. So that's the main reason why. And the, the fly shop uh, really, um, you know, little by little, you know, you, you see less and less. Yep. Yeah. It's, no, I hear it's you. unfortunate. But they're not going to disappear. I can tell you that. They're not going to disappear. I mean, in, the, in other areas, you know, outside of the Long Island, I see, uh, you know, brand new fly shops. They're just coming in and, they, and they're doing good because they diversify themselves. They will have the fly shop. But also they will be strong into the internet, so mm-hmm. it does not make them alive, which is a good thing. You know, I hate to see uh, a fly shop disappearing. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. I think the yeah, I think everybody knows the fly shops are the kind of the the, the soul right of, of fly fishing. I mean, that's that's the local. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the local. And uh, you know, I strongly suggest to anyone, you know, to support your local fly shop. It's uh, I think it's a, the right thing to do. Well, let's put this away. Don't just go, uh, you know, make it easy in yourself. Uh, if you do have a fly shop close by your home, you should go ahead and support that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm with you. We actually have. I love to give a shout out to the uh, the Gorge Fly Shop when I can out in our neck of the woods. We have a, a local fly shop that's uh, working with us. And if, if folks want to go to wetflyswing.com/gorge uh, that are in our area. Uh, you know, they can support a local fly shop and this podcast and the same thing. So there are Absolutely. ways, yeah, there are ways to do it. You don't have to buy from uh, from Amazon necessarily, right? I mean, there's a lot of easy ways to do it. Uh, and, and like shipping is pretty good. I mean, most of these shops could ship, uh, you know, like within just pretty close to Amazon. It might not be fully free at, at every situation, but it's pretty good. Well, look, <clears throat> we all know that uh, a, a fly shop, you know, not not even my my company, you know, can put in the same level as Amazon. You know what I no. mean? It's impossible. No. But you know, if you can, or let's say you want to uh, buy online, you know, my suggestion is very simple: don't go straight to Amazon. You know, look for the local fly shop. You know, be yeah. supported. Even you know, even online, you don't you know you don't have to have a fly shop. You know close by you and get in the car if you don't have that you know don't go straight to amazon you know support the fly shop that's that's it's the best thing you can do 
And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. What's worse than a day with no bites? A day without coffee, or even worse, a day with bad coffee. Thankfully, that isn't the case for us. With more than 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee team roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. That's why they've released a brand new coffee subscription program made just for you. Just visit anglerscoffee.com, provide your coffee preferences, your mailing address, and how much coffee you drink in a week, and they'll take care of the rest. There's no obligations or hidden fees, just great coffee delivered to your front door. And I've been using and loving Angler's Coffee, and I am a coffee fanatic and have tasted uh, bad coffee for sure. Angler's Coffee is definitely great coffee. I've been enjoying it. Um, it's as good, to be honest with you, it's as good as, as I've had <laughs> that I can remember. And that's pretty awesome saying uh, since I drink a lot of coffee. So uh, join me in supporting a great company who supports great coffee, fly fishing, and conservation. As part of Angler's Conservation Alliance, Angler's Coffee donates a portion of every sale to help conserve and protect our wild natural habitats and fish species. Right now, they're raising money for Soul River, which brings veterans and inner city youth out into the river to teach conservation, fishing skills, and more. Right now, you can get 20% off your first subscription box or gift box. Simply use the code WETFLYSWING at checkout. Just visit anglerscoffee.com and get 20% off your first subscription or gift box using Wet Fly Swing at checkout. That's anglerscoffee.com. And you actually had a fly shop, right, a, a while back. I'm not sure when you closed that down, but can you um, just describe kind of uh, briefly what, what that looked like? You know, take us to the old fly shop. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I started, uh, you know, fishing for stripes, I like a lot, and... Uh, uh, I say, you know, what the hell? I mean, let me let me give him a shot over here. But my idea, um, in my philosophy of the fly shop those days was basically um, towards fly tying materials than the you know the regular fly shop with the with the fly rods and reels and wetters and things like that. Because I had a passion, of course, to tie the fly. So the fly tying was my passion more than anything else. Yeah, I had some rods and wetters and reels, yeah. but mainly, uh, mainly I added, you know, pretty much whatever everyone will need it to tie flies. So let's say, you know, just to give an idea, let's say that uh, I was carrying a bucktail, and um, airline dobbing added, let's assume, 42 colors of bucktail. I used to carry 42 colors of this book, bucktail. Hmm. Every single color was, color was available. That is how wow. I had that. And same thing on the dobbing, and the same thing on the on the hako, and same things on uh, uh, a, uh, squirrel tail, and hmm. and so forth and so on. So that that was my philosophy because, you know, when I started, of course, you know, I wasn't really thinking that way. So I had, a, you know, people coming in and say, well, I need a book tail, but I need a book tail on, uh, on a hot pink. Yeah. And I didn't have to say, well, uh, my question was, why do you need a book tail on hot pink? And so they start explaining to me why I need this, why I need that. I say, gee, you know what? I guess I'm going to have to get the, the, you know, the book tail in the hot pink. Yeah. And, and so forth and so on. You build it because as a for request, I say, you know what? I think is is a good idea if there is a 42 colors available on the bucktail. Here it is, a wall full of 42 colors, and and have the people pick and choose because sometimes, you know, as you know, I'm sure you do know that when you're working into a fly shop, you know, to us fly ties are like a, a candy store. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, you you know you you buy some specific materials. You know, who yeah. knows what you see on that color or the application that you want to uh, use it for. But, you know, you see something and you buy. So yeah. uh, and that was my philosophy. So I say, you know what, if I cut it, you know, a, uh, a bucktail or a dubbing or whatever, whatever colors are available, that's exactly what I'm going to have. That's and it. That, that was that was a basically the fly shop I I, I started with it. Um, yeah. But, you know, 
So, and then at some point, I give up into that. I had a different ideas, the EP fibers and everything I have in my, in my mind that took off. And so I really didn't want to dedicate them myself. You know, dedicating yeah. yourself in a fly shop is a big work. That's it's right. a big job. That's right. Uh, yeah. I have different ideas. And the idea pretty much, you know, worked where I am today. And uh, believe in me, um, I, I, you know, there is a more to come. I'm not stopping right here. Oh, there good. There's plenty more to come. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I was wondering about that. I didn't know if you were <laughs> heading out completely. So, yeah, no, and I, and I know the fly shop. I grew up in a fly shop as a kid and most of my life. So I, I appreciate the the local, and we had a lot of fly tying materials as well. That was our really our focus. So I, I know how cool it is to go in and just be like, oh, man, all this material is amazing. Um, and what year, what, what was the name of the shop, and then what year was it that you started it and uh, started that thing? Um, it was um, 1991, okay. and the name was uh, the Practical Fly Shop. Oh, cool. I was a practical those days. I'm still a practical man. You know what I mean? I yeah. Uh, when I when I when I do something, I, I do something for a purpose and be practical, and and that's how you know all this EP product came out. Be, you know, again, I'm looking more what the fish like and not what the the fly fishermen uh, wanted. You know, I, I'm working the other way around. And you know, in many cases, it's very difficult to convince the you know the fly fishermen, you know, why this until they go into the water, and they cast the fly and they catch fish, and then they'll understand why. But sometimes it's difficult to explain. Yeah. You know. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I want to just touch base, you know, again on the materials and make sure we don't miss anything here. So. You know, anything else you want to talk about that, uh, you know, is some of the stuff you've developed over the years that we haven't covered here that might be good for fishing, you know, in salt water? Or really, I guess you, you talk about trout trout as well. Anything else you want to highlight here? Well, uh, look, the P fibers uh, pretty much it covers all the fishery out there. Oh, it does, yeah. Uh, rather you tie, yeah, rather you tie one-inch flies uh, to six seven inch flies and then of course you know when you get to the bigger uh fly pattern you know for offshore and then it's a different blending of the fibers you know a little bit more stiffer. Mm -hmm. but you know what it really made possible about the p fiber is that uh, you know the the fiber themselves they're very supple and uh they you know in the water they just do what the bay fish those and you know and uh, um, it's a materials that really give it to you what you're looking for when you do tie a pattern rather if it's a, a bunker type of a pattern which is a wide profile or a mullet type mm -hmm. which is a thinner profile or rather if you tie a inch and a half a little minnow flies I mean it's a very versatile and uh, that's the ability of these materials, you know. Yeah. And of diverse. course, you know, all all the variation now, the different blending that uh, uh, we're doing, and and uh, you know the the brushes. The, this is handless when it comes to the brushes. You know, uh, brushes. We go from salt water to fresh water, including steelhead and salmon. So yeah. just to figure out why this. You know the range on on all the materials of that uh, you, you know EP has created for all these years. You know, starting when I had the practical fly shop. You know, back in the early ninety. Yeah, <laughs> long, long time. Yeah, yeah, that's and right. And of course, you know, you know those days. Of course, you know it was a battle for me, uh, convincing the people that uh, you know you got to look in, you know, with the wide you know, with 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 a open mind and wide eyes. You know, it's not you're not limited just on natural materials. You know, the synthetic materials. You know, in many cases, it will do better than uh, uh, than the natural. You know, will serve the purpose for many different patterns. Yeah, uh, better than natural. You know, I'm not saying that the natural material is no longer good or is is no good or whatever i'm not saying that but 
you know, and people these days understood what I understood on the early 90, pretty much. Yeah. And, and, and the product you have now, um, I mean, obviously it's evolved over time, but is it, uh, I mean, it's pretty similar to what you first started with when you got going with the brushes or is it, uh, I mean, is it always it, constantly changing? No, uh, uh, bottom line, there is no changing. Yeah. I, he, through the year, it has been an evolution, you know, and I always have been improved, uh, you know, the, the product. Uh, but when it comes to the EP fibers, basically it's been the same fibers that when I first started on the early 90s. That hasn't changed at all. Uh, I haven't changed anything because after uh, all these years, is really doing the job and uh, still full those fish out there, so no reason to change was forever. That's right. I've been doing the, I've been doing different blending, yes, uh, new colors, of course. Uh, but the big change was when I started with the fibers, uh, with the brushes. I'm sorry. So yeah. the brushes and is an evolution. Is adding a little bit of this, a little bit of that, some new, newer materials. A newer way to do uh, the brush, but um, base of the P five is still there. Is that? Yeah, I don't think is it, will, it will ever change. Okay, perfect. And and when people are using this to tie, if they haven't tied with this before, is it pretty simple? Are you just pretty much just just wrapping this thing around the hook and then pulling it back and tying it off? I mean, or is there more to it than that? No, it's a, it's not a complicated tie. I mean, you know, if you go into my website. AP flies, you will see. I mean, I have a um, little bit over 100 videos available. Oh wow! Uh, people can uh, dig into it. Uh, there is a videos with the tips and tricks as well. You know, Perfect. there is a, a several videos that show you how to do how to tie dry flies for trout. So the information is out there. And again, I mean, today uh, there is a so many talented fly ties out there that uh, they've been going crazy. And then I'm very happy to see that, you know, and, and see what people can do with the EP product. Uh, basically, you know, I created the tools and I gave it the tools to everybody pretty much. And I say, okay, you know, this is the tool. Let me see, you know, show me how you use that. And uh, believe me, I've been seeing quite a few good things out there. I'm very happy to see that. Nice. I'm very happy that contributed to that. That's of cool. course. That's cool. All right. So uh, yeah. So it's good to hear that you're going to be sticking with it as we uh, move along forward. And obviously, you're not. You're not. It's not like you're some old old person, right? You've been doing this a long time, but you, you've got <laughs> you've got a lot of a lot of days left in you, right? Well, you know, <laughs> look, uh, <laughs> uh, I have a I have a my age. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong, and uh, I. I would like, let's put it this way, I don't think I will ever retire. Yeah. Uh, although my my son Daniel took over the company. Oh, EP cool. Fly, and he's managing P Flies and he is is he's doing great. I mean, he awesome. he, he has the, he has the passion. So I pretty much dedicated myself, to, you know, concentrating myself. You know, uh, what else I can put together uh, for. You know, for all the fly ties out there, I, mean, I have some ideas. I'm working on something really cool stuff right now, and I would like to go fishing a little bit more. I mean, I think I'm entitled to that, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> so and, and that's what I'm going to do. It. You know, I will dedicate myself, uh, you know, to make sure that uh, EP product it will be available out there, and um, we stick it with the quality that I always have been. Uh, giving to everyone from day one, and uh, we are very, we're very proud to say that our quality never changed, always been improved, and uh, that's what people really like about us. You know, we we don't deny quality. Period. We never did it, never will. Yeah, that's great, and that's great to hear that Dan's going to still be uh, running things, keeping things going strong over there. Is Abs yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's cool. Okay. Um, well, I feel pretty good about, uh, I got a little bit of uh, background on, on what you do a little more than I originally, um, kind of thought about. Um, 
I guess, you know, as far as uh, we, we noted uh, a couple of resources, but it's probably your website is probably the best place just to send somebody if they want to learn about tie in with this material or some of the patterns and things like that. It sounds like you have a pretty good resource. Absolutely. I, I mean, look, you know, we are dedicated uh, in, in, in our website, you know, we are dedicated to give all the information we can. And of course, all the EP products are available you know, in, in, in our site. Uh, I don't expect any, anyone out there to carry 100% of EP product. It will be impossible, that I know. So, and the, the product that you'll see in our website pretty much is the product that uh, we use to tie the flies. And uh, you will find everything 100%. Uh, materials and flies and tools um, components, they're all there. So basically, we carry uh, the product that we tie the flies. That's it. Yeah, you, you got every, everything. Yep. Everything anybody needs is over there, and they can just go check it out right yep. now. And that's uh, absolutely. And that's uh, let's let's remind everybody that's just epflies.com. That's correct. Yep. All right. Perfect. And uh, yeah, I guess just before we take it out of here, I just wanted to note, um, you know, just kind of on a, a little bit of a more of a general note. Uh, so we talked about stripers today a little bit, uh, but as far as you, when you choose, if you just say, you know, one species you have to fish for for the rest of time, uh, what are you going for? Um, that will be tarpon. Tarpon. Yep. Yeah. I can I can really keep on going for tarpon because. I don't know what it is about those fish. Uh, to me, it's, it's a magical. Uh, you go fishing for those fish, and I feel like there is a relation between me and those fish. Rather, if they are a juvenile tarpon, up to 200-pound tarpon. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a, that, that relation. There is a, that feeling. And there is a, that respect on both sides, you know. And uh, everybody should do that. Not only with top of with with any fish out there, you go fishing and be respectful, because if we do that, you know we will have a, all those fishery from yep. generation to come. And to me, that is it's a really really important, um, and you know it's very very joyful to go fishing out there. And catch one two fish a day, and um, you will remember for the rest of your life. Yeah, uh, and that's what I have to say about. Perfect. But to me, that tarpon is just you know is a magical fish to go fishing for. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it, it. Seems like tarpons the the one of the species definitely that well probably the if I had to say most people a majority of people that, that answer that question, I think tarpon is on, uh, high on the list. So, okay. And one, uh, uh, Enrico, one random one before we get out here. I always love when I have time to ask this one, uh, about music. I'm not sure if you listen to music, if you have a favorite uh, type of music or band or anything like that, anything you want to throw out there? <laughs> <laughs> well, my, uh, my, um, my favorite music, believe it or not, is a classic. Uh, I like opera. Um, um, one of my favorite is a Mozart. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, but um, you know, one of the modern or recent band that I I follow the most, believe it or not, is Queens. <laughs> oh, is is who is who now? Queens. Oh, okay. All right, perfect. Yeah, the band. Oh yeah. All yeah. them. I mean, of course, is a is an oldie like me, but. Um, uh, that's pretty much just my my music. In fact, when, when I sit down, when I sit down and I tie a bunch of flies and or new flies or whatever, uh, just you know, close the door and uh, I have my glass of red wine and uh, light them up a cigar. And I have my mother to keep me company and. Uh, that's it. Yeah, where you go? That's that's <laughs> it. Yeah, the and the cigar. So, what are the uh, what, what's your cigar of choice if you had to go for one right now? Well, when when I can grab it, when I when I can get it is uh, uh, my cigar of a choice is uh, Opman. It's oh. a Cuban cigar, but they're not easy to find them. 
uh, yet. But, you know, when I go traveling out there and I'll be able to grab a boxy in there, that's that's my yeah. choice. Well, how do you spell that? Hopman. Oh, Hopman, it's yeah. H-U-P-A-N-T, Hopman. H-U-P-A-N-T. Okay, Hop, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, well, I guess that's all I have for you, Enrico. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, do you want to give a shout out in the next uh, six months to a year? Anything new you got coming? Uh, you want to, you know, with you or yourself personally or the business? Let's let's say that uh, uh, I'm working on uh, a, on a new purpose that probably would change the way people think about purpose. Oh, cool. um, you know, top water is always a good fishing. It's always exciting, and I'm working on this uh, purpose that probably will be released on the next couple of months, and I, I believe it's going to change the way uh, you know purpose been fished for the forever. Uh, mm-hmm. They will be extremely easy to cast, and you know the, any any average caster, you know, including me, be able to handle this purpose and and, and do very well. Nice. Nice. That's exciting. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll put a link out to epflies.com. And I think obviously this episode is going to live out there for a long time. So maybe people right now can head over there and just take a look at what you have. Uh, to- yep. to- yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah. Enrico. Hey, thanks for all the time today. I appreciate uh, everything you've done, you know, for fly fishing and saltwater and, uh, and yeah, just taking the time to share your wisdom. It's been uh, very uh, helpful and we'll h- hope to keep in touch with you. Well, um, I'm happy to, you know, to be here available to anyone, of course, and any any question anyone might have it, it's easy to find me, you know, just, you know, send me an email and get in touch with Daniel and uh, any way we can help anyone with any questions. Um, I always done that. And uh, yes, you know, it's good to talking with people, exchange information. Uh, I am the type of a person I'm always open to any suggestion and uh, why not you know is yep you know in life the good thing is when we understand the principle of sharing you know you have something and you share it with everybody that's the best thing you can ever do exactly thank you very much appreciate it be well so there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 210. Again, if you can, please subscribe uh, and uh, you'll get updated when the next episode drops. We've got some good stuff going on here coming up this next uh, couple weeks and beyond. So that's the best way to stay in touch. Uh, also, uh, we've been shouting out to the Member Society. We've got a lot of great stuff going on there. I uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode and looking forward to catching up with soon. Hope to maybe see you online or maybe on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.